Thank you. The chair will call the October 1st, 2019 meeting of the city council to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. And we have the honor of Abraham Lincoln Council 13 Boy Scouts to come forward and lead us in the pledge. <coughs> of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And if you'd uh, come to the mic and uh, let us know your name and what you're working on for your badge and also what school or anything else you'd like to share with us. Uh, well, hello. My no. name is Harrison Gray, and uh, I'm in Boy Scouts, uh, Boy Scouts of America Troop 13. Um, uh, uh, from First United Methodist Church, and for uh, the communications merit badge, <coughs> one of the requirements is to attend a a uh, like a city or meeting of uh, of types of sort. So I'm here to attend that. Excellent. So, well, thanks for coming, Harrison. No problem. Well Thank done. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Alderman Redpath. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderwoman Desenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donlin. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. Um, I don't know, if Scott Dahl, if you have a presentation to present. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. So it falls upon us and we wanted to give you a recap of our summer digital marketing program, our leisure summer di digital marketing program. Before I call Emily Lynch up from uh, Sinclair Digital, just a, a couple quick notes. Uh, this was, uh, this uh, ran spring and summer uh, this year and a uh, unique, unique campaign for us uh, because it was built around our 10th anniversary History Comes Alive program. It's our living history program. Um, so we made that the main attraction. Although we were promoting the city, all of our sites and attractions, our, our visitor center, uh, Abe's Hat Hunt, uh, Knights Action Park, all of those were included in that. But the centerpiece was our History Comes Alive and it will be moving forward. We had new targets as well. We targeted um, East Iowa, we targeted South Wisconsin, and we targeted the Western Kentucky, along with uh, our traditional Chicago and St. Louis markets as well. We combined traditional marketing uh, along with this digital, but this was our largest digital um, campaign that we've had, and thanks to the City Council for approving it in the spring. Two goals in mind. Uh, one was a call to action. We wanted to be sure that any of the, anybody that was traveling that hadn't quite had their plan set yet um, would think about Springfield, and you'll see that in the PowerPoint coming up. Um, and then really we were setting up for next summer. We were setting up for summer of 2020. Anyone that's in marketing knows that you, know, you're, you won't have immediate action. You're really building year to year. So we're looking at uh, summer of 2020. We'll continue the digital marketing program, continue uh, the emphasis on history comes alive. Speaking of History Comes Live, it was the 10th year, and so in front of you, you'll see these brochures. And we had a new logo for the 10th anniversary. We revised and modernized the logo, thanks to Jeff Berg and, and the tourism department. Um, this brochure here as well, this is a new brochure, um, so unveiled this year. There was new scheduling and programming. So if you flip through, you'll see um, that the heaviest days were Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. Um, and you'll see all the different programs that we had that we offered throughout the, the summer, these living history programs. And there was over a thousand programs delivered this summer uh, through History Comes Alive. Uh, very unique. Uh, there's not another city that has this History Comes Alive program, uh, and we're very, very proud of it. Some of the channels over the top, these streaming channels, video display, Facebook, Instagram, email marketing, Emily will cover those in just a minute. But uh, overall, uh, parents, grandparents, empty nesters, uh, cultural, artistic, history, really our targets uh, as, we, as we looked at through this campaign this summer. So without further ado, Emily Lynch. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, we'll get started here. So um, thank you to the City Council for the um, History Comes Alive campaign that we did this past summer together that Scott mentioned. 
As you can see on the next slide, there was over 6 million views in those areas of focus that Scott mentioned. We used four main marketing solutions of OTT commercials, display and video impressions, Facebook, and email sends on those areas of focus. The first solution that we used was OTT. So that's those non-skippable commercials that we see on our smart TVs through OTT distribution platforms like Roku, Apple TV, YouTube TV, et cetera. In those cities, the areas of focus, you served over 545,000 commercials in those um, areas of focus. And this next slide is an example of the OTT commercial um, that you could have seen in those areas if you resided there. Come celebrate 10 years of history comes alive and meet me, Abraham Lincoln, in Springfield, Illinois this summer, home to more historic sites for your 16th president than anywhere in the world. Hope your amazing trip today. So the creative was great. We rotated with three different commercials for that. And the next marketing solution we used was video outreach and display outreach. So those are those ads you see on your mobile device or a desktop when you're on national sites like AccuWeather, CNN, New York Post, in those towns of the area of focus, along with the demographic. And you served over 700,000 impressions over the summer in those areas. 500,000 were displayed. 200,000 were video. So that OTT commercial that we just saw was an example of one of the ads you could have seen on video impressions. We promised we would give you 700,000 impressions and we over delivered that by 1,700. This is an example of one of the display ads that you could have seen if you had resided in those areas of focus that Scott mentioned. You'll see it's a um, animated um, uh, display creative, so it started in black and white, and then it moved to color when the History Alive Comes Alive um, logo came up, and then a text overlay. Okay, the third solution that we used was Facebook. And so in the campaign, you had over 5 million total Facebook impressions and 341,000 total Facebook actions. So that's great. That's all the likes, the shares, the comments, the views. And those ads, you'll see the one will look familiar on the left because that is what we just saw for the OTT example. So two of them were video and one of them was a static ad encouraging people to come to our city this past summer. Okay, the next thing that we did was um, Facebook Lives. So that's something you could have seen on the WICS News Channel 20 or Fox Illinois Facebook page in our own backyard. We did six Facebook Lives. So we sent a reporter out, like when the statues got delivered outside the Presidential Museum. We were at the um, Edwards Place for an ice cream social. We filmed the Lincoln Troubadours at the Old State Capitol. And this is an example of one of them at the New Visitor Center with Billy Herndon, Mary Todd, and Abraham Lincoln. My name is Billy Herndon, and uh, I was Mr. Lincoln's partner for more than 20 years. My father helped to move the state capitol to Springfield and ran the Indian Queen Hotel. So when Lincoln first visited Springfield, he stayed at my father's place. And I do programs at 12.30 each Thursday and Friday in the law office. And then I'm also over at the old state capitol where we tried more than 200 um, state Supreme Court cases. And so every court case is a story, and there's lots of good lawyer jokes. <laughs> great information. You can learn small facts like that that not a lot of people may know about here in Springfield of Unique History. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I also want to ask one more question. What are some fun things that people may learn about the Lincoln throughout these events that they may not know about from reading in history books? Well, uh, we like to talk uh, when we, we do our, we do a conversation or at home with the Lincolns, I think is what they title it. And uh, Mr. Lincoln and I enjoy just sitting and just telling some of the White House stories, and especially the ones about the boys, because the boys created so much mischief while they were in the White House. <laughs> so we thought we would share some of these delightful stories and not so delightful stories <laughs> with people, just because they may not read that in all the history books. And, and to me, and I think even Mr. Lincoln, we loved our children. So we want to make sure that everybody knows everything about our children. They may have been troublemakers, but there was a soft side to them as well. So that's an example of one of the Facebook Lives that we had on the News Channel 20 Facebook page. The final solution that we used was email marketing. So we sent out emails in mass quantities to the areas that Scott mentioned. We sent out six emails in a quantity of 60,000 apiece, 
And in that, you had great results. You more than doubled the national average for opens on the emails as well as click-throughs. And that's an example of what one of the emails looked like on the right side of the screen there. And then after each email, you got these really nice reports afterwards that showed um, areas of interest, where people had clicked on the most, everything. Um, it really took the, um, picked the email apart. And that's everything. So thank you so much for your business this past summer, and we look forward to working with the um, Convention of Visitors Bureau again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, yep. Any questions or comments? Scott, you want to say anything to wrap it up? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to let the record reflect that Alderman Redpath has joined us. Well, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Sinclair Digital. Uh, it was a uh, huge campaign for us and very, very successful. We're very pleased with with how it went this summer and, and really our, our leisure traffic, uh, and we're just looking to increase that next summer as well. So. Thanks. You want to mention the looking for Lincoln while you're up there? The oh, the today. new wayside? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we um, we relocated the wayside um, at the old State Capitol Plaza for uh, looking for Lincoln. So when you go there, it, it was on a stand. We relocated it over to between the light posts. So it's really a, a better location for our visitors now, just outside of our visitor center. So real happy with that. We did that this morning. Yep. It's uh, vertical instead of the horizontal. Yep. That's good. So. Hey, Scott, I want to say thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alden. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, I believe our auditors are here. Is that right, Bill? Yes. So if you'd like to come forward and state your name, we'd appreciate it. And the uh, company as well. Hello, good evening. My name is Joel Lightcap. I'm a partner with Baker Tilly Birchow Kraus, uh, and we performed the city's audit um, for their year ended February 28th, 2019. I have a couple of documents um, that I'll be going over very briefly tonight, um, just some comments from us. But if you have any questions, you know, if you've seen the documents, feel free to ask me any questions or stop me. We can go over in more detail, should you prefer. Um, First off, I'd like to Excuse publicly, me, uh, Mr. Mayor uh, Joe, are you uh, reporting on the on the uh, CAF for the uh, consolidated annual financial report? Correct. Okay, we received that. Are there any other documents you're reporting upon? I have a communication to those charged with governance and management. It's our kind of management letter. I will talk about that as okay. well tonight. Thank you. Yep. So first, I would like to publicly thank the Office of Budget and Management and CWLP for their help and their assistance in performing the audit. We come in, we ask a lot of questions, we ask for a lot of support, um, and everybody was very well prepared, very knowledgeable. Um, it really helps us uh, get through our procedures and, and be able to issue our, our reports uh, in a timely manner. The first um, comments I'll have is on the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. And as the name suggests, it's comprehensive. It's more comprehensive than what is required um, by accounting standards. It provides additional information. There's a transmittal letter in the front that gives a lot of good information about the city. Uh, and there's also some statistical tables in the back that gives you good trend information over a 10-year period. Um, so you can see how the, the city is doing year over year. Um, our independent auditor's report we um, once again issued a clean or unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements. This is the highest level of assurance you can get from your outside auditors and states that everything's reasonable in all material respects and can be reasonably relied upon by an outside user. One um, accounting standard that was adopted during the year was um, Governmental Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 75 which put um, on the city's full accrual statements, those are the statements that have all the assets and liabilities of the city, um, and put an additional liability on the books um, for the uh, post-employment benefits other than pensions, so retiree health uh, costs. It values that back to kind of today's, it looks at estimate of future dollars for that, um, and puts the liability on the books. Uh, it also resulted in a restatement of the beginning that position um, so that your expenses didn't fluctuate as much year over year. 
the um, kind of one thing I did want to point out is within the document after our um, opinion is the management's discussion and analysis. This is a great document written by management. It gives you a great um, understanding of what happened year over year. Um, so if you're really looking to see what happened in the different funds or in the city as a whole, that's where I would go and spend your time to kind of get that information. Uh, additional to that, there's there's some statements and notes to the financial statements. Just a lot of detail. You can go from the MDNA, which is very summarized and, and and easier to read. And you go through the statements and then those to financial statements, which give you really good in depth uh, information on what happened during the year. Uh, I wasn't going to go into too much detail on the numbers unless there were any questions. I was going to go into the mm -hmm. the second report. Any questions on the Kaffir in general? Hello, uh, Mr. Wayne. <coughs> Alderman McMenamin. Joe, I was going to try to catch you before the meeting started uh, to just to um, uh, direct you to page 102 and 103. So sorry to get you like this. Uh, I came early, but unfortunately I didn't find you. Um, so sorry about this. But I just want to uh, highlight the um, police and fire pension funds that the um, on the Police side, the unfunded liability increased from 159 million to 169 million. That's on page 102, Joe, towards mm -hmm. the bottom where it says employer's net pension liability. And then on for firefighters, the unfunded liability increased from 170 million to 184.8 million. So in combination, the total debt the city owes police and fire. Uh, pensions increased $23 million is what I came up with, Joe. So if I'm incorrect on that, you know, I'll, I, I'll give you my card, and I just want to verify what, what I found in the, the report when I studied it. Those are, those are the numbers derived by the, your uh, independent actuary. Um, the main driver this year was the, the fourth quarter, um, 2018, the market was way down, so that brought down the market value of the investments, so in turn um, raised the amount. You'd have to, additional funding would need to cover the estimated liabilities. In the first quarter of 19, the, those, um, well, this is February, this is valued at February 28th, but after that, um, the values did go up again in kind of around your fiscal year end. Um, so I would imagine the next valuation, you'll see some more fluctuations in those numbers. And I agree that numbers do fluctuate within the year and from year to year, Joe. And I realize this is your first year auditing our report. Um, I've been on the council eight years, so I've been looking at the long-term trend. And so, for example, my first year on the council eight years ago, the total uh, pension debt for a police and fire was 175 million. So now it's up there at 352. So it's doubled in eight years. So that the trend is really troublesome. And um, I might call you about this independently, you know, and, and talk about it some more. Sure. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thank you. Any other questions on the CAFR or comments? Yep. Thank so you. Um, kind of in conjunction with that on the communication to those charged with governance and management, this is kind of the middle part of how, what I talk about on that, but you know, we work for the council. Um, we work with management to do the, the audit, but we work for council. If there's any uh, questions or concerns or anything you'd like to talk to us about, we're definitely always open for those discussions. Um, and I look forward to that. Um, the rest of that letter um, satisfies a few other auditing standards. Um, the first being a report on internal control. We look at internal controls at the city over the major transaction cycles to perform or to plan the nature, timing, and extent of our audit procedures, not to provide an opinion on internal controls, but if something were to come up that we feel the council should be aware of, um, or um, we would put that in this letter. Um, I'm happy to report, as we reported last year, um, there are no, no comments in the, in related to internal controls for the city's attention. Also, um, there's a letter that talks about any disagreements that we might have had or material adjustments or anything like that. Um, once again, there's, there's nothing to report in that letter. It's a pretty stock standard letter, which is good um, for you to see. Um, additionally, at the end of that letter, there's um, some information uh, from management, kind of bullet points on, on what we received or what we asked for, just kind of their representations that we received everything we asked for. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions on that report. Any questions regarding that? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
Carol, entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the September 17th, 2019 City Council meeting and approve the minutes. So moved. Uh, second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Chair, I'll entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading, first reading of ordinances in the record of the city council meeting. We'll move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of this city council meeting. So moved. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Both say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to place the consent agenda on final passage. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Agenda number 2017 1003, 2018 110, 2019 008, 2019 276, 2019 421, 2019 438, and 2019 430 remain tabled or in committee. Alderwoman Desenso. Yes, I'd like to bring out 2019 428. Second. Been moved and second to bring out uh, 2019. 428 and second. We don't have to have discussion. That's automatic, right? Okay. I have one. Alderwoman Turner. Uh, 2019 232, please. And 2019 232. Any others? Uh, the first ordinance that came out is having to do with a uh, animal sales in the city. Alderman Turner, what does your ordinance have to do with? Um, um, liquor license. Thank you. The 232, is, it's on debate. I'm sorry? 232, I believe, is on uh, debate. Is that what you said? No, we just pulled it out. Oh, I just pulled it out of yep. oh, committee. Okay. It was in committee. I, I got you. Chair will entertain a motion to, uh, well, we removed it. Next item on the agenda is 2019-232, an ordinance amending Chapter 90, Section 90.24 and Chapter 110.071 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended relating to video gaming. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2019-232 on final passage. It does it. That's, that's not the correct mm -hmm. That's not it. No. I was confused too, Mayor. I apologize. I might have thrown you off. Okay. Stop it. That's 432, not 230. Here it is. Yeah. 2019-232, an ordinance amending Chapter 90, Section 90.15 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to Class L liquor licenses. Is that the right one? Yes. yes that's it. Sorry. <laughs> Is there a motion? Motion for debate. A motion for move. Second. And I have an it amendment. Boomed. And second. Uh, discussion on the amendment. Or the, um, go ahead and present the amendment. amendment number one that uh, was at everyone's desk. And this is pretty simple. It's a, it introduces a Class L liquor license that allows uh, hotel motels to sell packaged uh, beer and wine out of their pantries. And it's very specific on the amount that may be sold and to whom it may be sold. Um, this is something that's it's a new license for Springfield, but not new uh, throughout the state. A lot of uh, other cities are doing this. And it's my understanding that we already have a few hotels and motels that are currently selling packaged liquor from their pantries. Um, so with the passage of this license, I would ask that our liquor commission um, do an audit and identify those that are currently uh, operating without this license and uh, give them 30 days in order to come into compliance. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Further discussion. So is this for passage tonight? Yes. Oh, so to be honest, I haven't read this in probably a couple of months, maybe two or three months. And I know we've got another ordinance coming out of um, that was being held, but we kind of read that more recently, the, 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 uh, the sale of 
um, cats and dogs. So I'm, I'm more refreshed with that one, and I'm prepared to discuss it. But this one I'm unfamiliar with, Alderman Turner. Would it be a problem? And I'm sure the others are too. Um, would it be a problem if we discuss this in committee of the whole next week? Um, well, the the amendment actually, the, when the ordinance was first introduced, there was some discussion about it, and um, then when I had the ordinance prepared, I circled back around to say, you know, there's an ordinance that I think we're going to be okay. That there's an amendment that I think we're going to be okay with it. Um, I really would like to move it because uh, there was one specific entity that had contacted me that was interested in moving forward with the sale at their location, and I've actually been holding this up with them for probably three or four months, so I would be a little bit uncomfortable to, you know, continue to hold it up. Any other discussion on the amendment? I, um, I'll just reply by saying I think you know, the sale of packaged beer and wine to registered hotel guests, is that what this is about? It is, and it limits the amount of, uh, the amount to 12, 12, 12 ounce bottles of beer and three bottles of wine, and it's only to registered hotel guests, and there's also another caveat included in the amendment that requires that anyone who operates the pantry has to have uh, be uh, Bassett trained. Well, I, I, this might be a good idea. I don't I know, but I just haven't idea. thought about it. I, I think there can be problems that arise. I don't see the the amount that can be sold stated. In it is the, stated in the amendment. It's, well, it's, it's last page of your packet. Mm -hmm. so that's what I'm getting at. We just haven't had a chance to study it. And uh, so we just got this on our desk. Uh, two or th uh, at the start of the meeting, uh, that was uh, 25 minutes ago. So uh, this may be a good idea, and uh, you think it is, and it may be, but I'm gonna vote no just because I just don't think it's a good procedure. And I, I think it's bad for us to get into the habit of bringing things forward that may be of concern to the public, but the public's had no chance to think about this or has had no notice of what we're gonna do tonight. So I just think that's a bad policy in all honesty. Any other discussion on the amendment? No question. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. say nay. No. Motion carries. All those in favor of the motion as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <clears throat> and the motion passes. Nine voting yes, one voting no, one voting present. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2019-425, an ordinance approving the appointment of LaShonda Fitch as executive director of Oak Ridge Cemetery for the Office of Public Works. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2019-425 on final passage. So moved. Second. It's coming up next. Yep. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. Motion, or ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. And Michael Ellis, uh, he couldn't make it tonight. We thank him for his service. He'll be at the, I believe, the October 15th uh, meeting. He'd like to say a few words of thanks to the uh, council and everyone for allowing him to service. Next item on the agenda is 219-4. Yep. You want to come up with Sean and say a few words? Or did you say enough last week? <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh, you can come to the mic. Always. <laughs> LaShonda well, gave a nice presentation of the committee as a whole, so the alderman heard it at that point in time, but be good to reintroduce yourself for the audience. So I am reintroducing myself as LaShonda Fitch. I've been a resident here for nine years with my husband, Nick Fitch, who's in the back with the white 
t-shirt, um, <laughs> freshly shaved, so good job, honey. But yes, I, I am very, very honored to be um, the opportunity to serve as the executive director for Oak Ridge Cemetery. I do understand my soon-to-be predecessor has done a significant job out there restoring the cemetery, and I do look forward to continuing his good efforts. Um, and as I stated last week, uh, be able to um, move us forward as far as with technology and all the great things as well. Um, so again, thank you so, so much for this opportunity. I look forward to serving you all as the council and the public behind me along with the boards that I serve as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lashana. Oh, any questions? <laughs> I was told I had to ask the questions last time. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is 2019-428, an ordinance amending Chapter 91 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended pertaining to animal control regarding cats and dogs in pet stores. <coughs> is there a motion? Uh, I'd like to move it to debate. Second. Been moved and second moved to debate. Any discussion? I'm happy to discuss this. Sure. Um, what this ordinance does, currently Springfield doesn't have any pet stores, um, and we don't want any pet stores, because what pet stores do uh, traditionally are sell, they sell puppy mill dogs, which there is a large presence of them in the Arthur, Illinois area, and cats. Um, what we prefer is face-to-face -face sale of dogs and cats or um, the adoption that you see at PetSmart and Petco um, and even Ace Hardware on the weekends. Uh, we haven't, uh, you all received a letter from the Animal Protection, Prote Protective League and it just explains that we have an overabundance of dogs that need to, animals, cats, dogs that need to be rescued. Um, I think there are a few people here from the Humane Society that want to speak on this and I'd I'd like to hear what they have to say as well. Yeah. Alderman Dolan? Just, just for clarification, could you explain, you, you were kind enough to explain to me, but could you explain to everyone the difference between what's presently here, what we, some people may call pet stores, that right. they're actually not. What we have really uh, in Springfield are pet supply stores. They sell toys and dog food and leashes and collars and little tags and you know crates and kennels and things like that. They are not selling um, these purebred dogs um, or cats. They are selling animals from the APL and other area organizations, the Feline Forever Ranch, to um, be adopted. So instead of going out and buying you know, a $5,000 puppy that is probably infected with parvo and heartworms, why wouldn't you go rescue a dog or a cat that has already been tested and um, has gone through the whole spay and neuter process it's just the smart, humane thing to do. And I've been on the soapbox of um, humanely treating animals as, for as long as I've been sitting on this council, and I'm gonna continue to beat that drum, and I think it's an important step that we need to take. Um, we, as a council, received an onslaught of emails from outside interests, out-of-state lobbyists, out-of-state uh, pet store owners, telling us to stop this ordinance. And I think that's a good indication that they plan on bringing a large pet store to Springfield. Um, it's gross, it's disgusting, and we don't need it here. So let's, let's do the right thing by our animals in this community and treat them humanely, and uh, let's, let's get on board with what, what, how animals should be treated. Alderman Hannah. <laughs> This, this does not affect breeders whatsoever in town or in the area, so nope. just want to make sure that's clear. No. I've bought two dogs from breeders, and I've rescued a dog. Um, when I bought dogs from breeders, I got to meet the, the mother and the father and, you know, know their history and know their lineage. So, uh, you know, that's, that's an important part of owning a pet is knowing you know where they come from and knowing that you're buying from a responsible breeder. It's a big deal. Um, as you can tell, I'm a little bit passionate about this, so. And there's uh, some audience members wanting to come up and speak to this. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. 
Good evening, City Council. My name is Mark Ayers. I'm the Illinois State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, also a resident of Alderman McMiniman in his ward. You're welcome. Hi, hey, Joe. Um, <laughs> I think my job was just done for me. Thank you, Alderwoman Asenzo, for bringing this forward. We're in full support. Um, and yes, yeah, so the stores that are here currently, uh, PetSmart, Petco, Pet Supplies Plus, they already do this. So it's already current practice. They adopt out animals by partnering with animal rescue organizations or rescues or animal control. That's simply all this ordinance does. Um, if someone can't find what they're looking for, um, you know, in the humane model, nothing in this ordinance prohibits you from going directly to a reputable breeder and finding an animal that way. This is just a commercial sales uh, prohibition. And um, this issue has made tremendous progress all over the state. Um, right now we have them in 11 cities in Illinois, Chicago, Cook County, Warrensville, Waukegan, Crest Hill, uh, Vernon Hills, Buffalo Grove, Kankakee County, uh, and West Chicago. Um, nationally, I just checked last night, we just achieved uh, 321 local ordinances throughout the entire country on this issue. So it's got tremendous progress. Um, three states don't have passed it statewide. Probably half a dozen more will be passing it probably in the next spring and fall legislative sessions. And it's a wonderful model to live by, and I'm proud to live here in Springfield that already has basically a humane model going for it. But we definitely need this ordinance to make sure that no commercial sale pet stores come here and sell puppy mill puppies. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Next. If there's anybody else wish to address the council on this matter. My name is Jane McBride, 3300 Forsyth, but I'm here today as a founder of Illinois Humane. We've been operating in this city for um, uh, since 2003. Before that, I was with APL for six years. Um, and I, I just want to uh, say that this is um, a very important ordinance. Um, we have, uh, you've got several rescue groups here in town that work very hard um, on adopting out animals. Uh, contrary to some of what the literature that you got, we do know our animals. We know the origin of our animals often. Um, our animals come up through foster homes. We know them very well. We counsel people when they're adopting animals. I think that's incredibly important when we're putting them in households across the city. We work with them to make sure they're getting the right an individual animals because we know our individual animals, but also the right breeds. There are our outlets for various breeds. Um, uh, we have a lot of very good local breeders, but there's always the breed rescues and there's breeders across the country or you know locally where people can get their purebreds. Um, I will say that uh, in all those years, when we did have a pet store here, because we do cruelty and uh, neglect investigations, I would get complaints repeatedly on the pet store that was in uh, the mall. Uh, it was a regular retail pet store. Um, I can tell you I got complaints almost every month. I would forward them to uh, Department of Ag, or we'd work through them ourselves, even to the point where they were lending money to 18-year-olds who didn't have a job um, on these sporadic buys, and I would get complaints from the parents. Um, uh, I, I took, uh, I started a practice where I would just give them Simon's management's number and say, uh, talk to them, and within a year that pet store was gone. I don't know if it was our impression, but I think once Simon heard what was going on there, uh, uh, that had a way in a little bit. Um, so I also say that the local retail outfits that we work with, we work with Nature Selects, PetSmart, uh, Petco, uh, Ace. Um, there's a lot of retail outfits that would really love to have us there. We can't fill all the requests, but they are very enthusiastic about what they do. We're very responsible when we bring animals to those locations. I will also say that your rescues are economic drivers. I'm not going to share with you my vet bills, but trust me, uh, we, we've sent many uh, vet students, uh, vet child uh, through college. Um, and uh, all of our rescues uh, do this kind of thing, so you are supporting the local work that's done here. Um, I don't think you're missing out on anything without the retail pet stores here. In fact, you are getting, um, when, we, when you can work with the rescues, you are getting a much better advised uh, person in getting that animal because it does make a difference how we place these animals. So uh, fully support of this ordinance, and I do ask your support, Alderman. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address council on this matter?
Good evening. My name is Nicole. Um, thank you for letting me speak this evening. I know firsthand um, how horrific puppy mills are because I do adoption of the puppy mill moms, dads. Um, I foster the puppy mill moms and dads. Um, I currently have a foster right now that I just got about two weeks ago um, from Iowa. She was in an Iowa puppy mill. Um, my partner had went in six months prior to this mill to get dogs out and she seen Kizzy and just knew that she would be dead when she went back. She was so weak she couldn't even sit up. Um, she only has one working limb. She can't stand. She can't walk. Um, and unfortunately, they were still breeding her. I don't know how you breed a dog that can't even stand, but they were. Um, she refused at that point six months ago to let Kizzy out of the puppy mill. Um, she went back in about two, three weeks ago, and she mentioned this dog's name because she was there to get other dogs. And the lady's like, yeah, Kizzy's still here. And she convinced her to let her take Kizzy out. So I now have Kizzy. She can't get to the water bowl like a normal dog. You know, she can't eat like a normal dog. And she was there for 12 years in a puppy mill on the cage, like because they're in cages basically that are stacked on top of each other. And she had no human contact. She, I mean, she couldn't even sit up. Now she's strong enough that she's able to at least sit up. Obviously, she'll never be able to walk. Um, so I am in full 110% support of this ordinance because of this reason. Like, we have enough animals in the shelters um, and the puppy, the puppy mill population, those poor parents, they're really, they don't get the vet care they need. They don't get anything. Half the time their teeth are rotting and they all have to be extracted when they do come out. They, they just, they aren't cared for. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Any questions? I just want to say thank you for what you do. Yeah. Huh? That's heartbreaking. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. She, <laughs> she's been a rough one and I've had several. Um, I actually have a, a boy puppy mill dog at my house right now too and he is absolutely traumatized. Like I'm talking just flies through the house because he is so scared of people, just runs. Um, it took me a good month to get him to start coming back in the house by itself. <laughs> so it's, it's really sad. So I thank you for looking into this ordinance and hopefully we don't ever have pet stores here <laughs> that thank sell puppy mill dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else wish to address the council on this matter? So it's been moved for approval, right? Yep. And second. All those in favor, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <laughs> the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2019-431, an ordinance appointing Sheila Stock Smith to the Springfield Economic and Community Development Commission. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2019-431 on final passage. I'll move. Second. second. We move in second. Any discussion? I know uh, she was here. If you'd like to come forward, or you did last time, didn't you? Any discussion? All those in favor, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. This time I'd like to uh, pause the agenda for uh, some tragic news that we received uh, today prior to the meeting but it's been made public. Uh, individual that's been a standard, uh, he's been a uh, First Citizen Award recipient. Um, also, uh, you know, he resurrected the uh, Toys for Tot campaign. He's been one of our uh, best sheriffs that we've ever served our community. He really understood service to the people, and that's Wes Barr, and uh, tragically, he had passed away today, so. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with him, and I'd ask everyone to pause for a moment of silence for his family who really need the prayers at this time.
Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 2019-432, an ordinance amending chapter 90, section 90.24, and chapter 110, section 110.071 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinance as amended relating to video gaming. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2019-432 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Yeah, Mayor. Yes, Alderman Hanauer. I would like to amend this uh, to where it says in Section F, it says 60% or more of gross annual revenues from food or beverage. But I'd like to strike food and beverage and just say non-gaming revenue. Or I guess it just say non-gaming sales. That's an amendment. That's the, to amend the amendment. Second. Been moving second to change the language where it says 60% striking food and beverage to uh, replace it with non gaming revenues or sales. And second it. Any discussion? Uh, I just have, thank you. I just have one question. Are we are we still considering capping these at some point? Are we still talking about it? Are we still tossing it around? Because what I worry about is, you know, we have more and more coming down the line, and I don't want to look into it and, you know, do all of that if we're going to cap it at some point. Mayor. Yes, Alderman Hanauer. Um, I, I worked very hard with corporate counsel Zirkel on trying to figure out a, a way to cap, and uh, it's extremely difficult. Um, if, if anyone wants to take that up, um, but it's it's going to be tough to, to cap, um, in my opinion. So. I think we'll, you know, it, it'll, it's kind of balancing out at this stage, you know. We have things close as others open, so um, at this stage, if someone else wants to take it up, but I, I wanted to get this in um, at this time. So. Well, you, de you definitely did a great job. Everybody did a great job. It's a great ordinance. I was just asking because I, I, I get those questions, and I didn't want to, you know, give, give somebody false in, impressions if we're going to look yeah. to cap it. Thanks. But I, I oh. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. Um, I, I just want to say, um, Alderman Gregory, that was one of the f components of the, um, with the now having audits and, and moving forward so that we don't have to wait for citizen complaints. Hopefully that'll sort of put some limits on people who think they can just come in and, and skirt our requirements. And that's a big part of my support for this. So thank you for that. And one thing about this, so just, just to let you know, um, Based on the language of the of of the rules on gaming, um, originally we were looking at doing an audit at the end, at the end of a year, and then six months later, if they were non-compliant, audit them again. Because of the language, we're not able to do that. We have to wait the following year, so they will have a year to, to in a sense, clean clean themselves up and and become compliant. So. Um, Again, I, I want to, you know, this is this is amend, amended the original um, ordinance that allows the six machine, and, and we've raised a, a few fees on it. So um, this is just this just pertains to um, if they if they are deemed non-compliant. Alderman McMinimum. Uh, Alderman Hanar, so this particular amendment we're discussing right now changes the 60% uh, rule that required you to have at least 60% from food and beverage to 60% of anything, is that? Right, the, the idea on that um, is for like a golf course, or I think Mr. McCarty brought up a, 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 a like a gas station, or you know, gas, gas and wash or whatever it's called, where they, they have a lot of other business through that's not beverage and, and food, you know, so we we've accepted that. It'd be like a ho or a hotel. If a hotel had it, you know, they may not do a lot of food or beverage, but they're they're bringing in for room sales and, and whatnot. So it seems like we're going to open up video gaming just about to anybody who wants it, because just about anyone will be able to qualify with 60% sales. If you're a hotel, they, you can get 60% from your hotel lodging. If you got 
and if you get a liquor license, you can, if you want to uh, have a clothing store, you know, you got, you're got going to have 60%. You're going to be able to meet this test. Just about anyone can meet this test. So i got a real problem with this. I don't you're know opening how, this up to everybody. So. I don't know how many clothing stores aldermen have well, I'm have just giving an outrageous example because in. I think this is I mean, an let's outrageous be, extension. Let's, let's be realistic about this. It's not... You're, you're talking about things that, that you... That people, we ha they have to come through us first. I'm certainly not going to vote for liquor sales on a on a clothing store. That's ridiculous. Well, the point is that we're opening this up to just about anyone that wants to sell anything. If they get a liquor license, they get video gaming. So we've we've got a saturation probably problem already in the city. We're going from five machines to six machines. We're going um, the um, the um, truck stops are going up. Um, I think this is, this is the kind of amendment that really should go through the committee of the whole. I think the existing video game operators would like to really pay attention to this because it, it, it potentially opens the door to a lot of new applicants for video gaming. That's the real concern. Yeah, I could speak to that a little bit. Uh, being the liquor commissioner, we get uh, requests all the time for liquor licenses if it's a barber shop, nail salon place, and uh, I think people somewhat forget what they're in the business for. They come and we've had restaurants even say, hey, we want video gaming and we're opening up a restaurant. It used to be that you'd have the restaurant and get the video gaming. So that is a concern that uh, if we do uh, water it down, because we do have a, uh, you know, we get a lot of requests for liquor licenses and I've turned them away. So I think uh, the more stringent we make it, the better, personally. I'm, I'm open to any what the council wants. I'm just, I was talking, and Mr. McCarty might be able to uh, provide some more information on this, but it was just something we were discussing. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it really comes down to, yeah, it's a policy issue that, that you all have to decide on, but the complication is that we already have some businesses that are in a situation where they probably aren't meeting that threshold in terms of food and beverage, but are meeting it with other activity, other revenue producing activity. So as I was talking to Alderman Hanauer about it, I pointed that out and we've actually been talking about it for a couple of years uh, internally in my office, if we ever got to the point of doing these audits on a routine basis, that it might become an issue. So what we're looking for in OBM where we'll be doing these audits, audits is clarification. We want to make sure there's no loopholes out there for anyone. If you want to stick to just food and beverage, we can certainly do the audits based on that. But again, there are some places that uh, potentially are out there now that wouldn't qualify under that, but they will qualify. Uh, there's a place, I think, on the Jefferson, the gas and wash. I don't know what their, their food and beverage sales are there, but I'm pretty sure that their, their gasoline and their uh, their car wash is probably more than make up uh, well above 60% of the sales. So it really comes down to a policy decision. We'll certainly do whatever you all want, but we are asking for some type of clarification here so that we know what we're looking for when we do these mandatory audits. I guess the gas and wash, do they, uh, do they serve the alcohol? I think it's supposed to be a service, or is that just a pick-up-and-go type beverage place? Alderman Dunn? Isn't, uh, isn't the gas and washed, uh, if I recall, it opened in prior to the rules of the 60% rule even being oh, the in effect? Yeah. It's on our non hmm. Interesting. Looks like we'll have to take a look at that one. Yeah, better check it out. That's what we've been asking for audits. There's someone from the audience wish to um, comment, but Alderwoman Turner? Uh, I, I think that all of us are concerned about the saturation of video gaming in the city. That's the reason why I think it, it becomes incumbent on each alder person when there is a, uh, a potential entity in your ward that's interested in video gaming that you know you make a conscious decision to say, no, I'm not going to support it. So everybody has that opportunity. I know just in the past six months, I've had three entities call me and say they want video gaming, and I've said, no, we're not doing that. So I think that that's one way that while it's difficult to address the um, saturation problem and putting a cap on it through ordinance, I think that we can all do that just by showing some um, discretion in how we support uh, op uh, businesses that want to operate in your ward. All business is not good business, and so I think that aldermen have a responsibility to um, 
you know, check out businesses and not just do a blanket, yes, you can, I will support you with video gaming. Mayor, real quick, I'm, I'm going to withdraw Hang that. On. Since since we only have one, maybe one Good. place that it affects, I'm going to go ahead and withdraw that, okay. that amendment to it. this amendment. Okay. Thank you. Woman I do Gregory? have a question, um, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take either one. Um, no, I, I just I have a question about um, in 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 terms of the liquor licenses because you did say that we get you get a lot of requests and that they do frequently get turned down. Do you have sort of some numbers on on the volume of requests that we get and and how many are denied? Yeah, we can uh, check with uh, Todd Oliver. Okay, thank yeah. you. We'll have him present a report. Thank you. You'd like to state your name and address you. for the council. Uh, We'd appreciate it. Anita Bedell. I'm the executive director of Illinois Church Action on Alcohol and Addiction Problems at 1132 West Jefferson Street. And uh, I'm glad that you with, withdrew that because that, that would be a, a major concern. They have uh, television repair shops. There's laundromats. There's all kind of businesses um, that are here or would come in uh, with that. But Springfield has more video gambling than any place in Illinois, and I know you've heard that statistics before, but I don't know if you know the extent of how many machines are here. There are 599 machines and 129 establishments. Springfield has 200, 300, 400, and 500 more machines than most places in Illinois. There are only two other places that have over 400 gambling machines in Illinois, and Springfield has close to 600. Plus, you'll be getting another 50 video gambling machines at the state fairgrounds with the new gambling law that was passed. So um, increasing the number of video gambling machines from five to six uh, at establishments and gas stations and 10 at major uh, truck stops is the equivalent of adding 20 to 30 more video gambling establishments in the city. That's huge. And Bloomington and Aurora and other home rule municipalities are keeping the curtain ordinances in place to five machines. They are increasing the amount of fees that are required. Uh, many are having moratoriums so that they, they're not capping, but they're having a moratorium so no more machines are coming in. And they're also leaving it at five. And this is what we would like Springfield to do. Last month, Area residents lost over $2.9 million in the city video gambling machines, $2.9 million in one month. And since um, it, video gambling was legalized in Springfield, over $176 million has been lost in those machines. And the city only gets a nickel for every dollar of revenue that uh, comes from them. The state and the gambling interests are already going to profit because of the new gambling la uh, language that increased the maximum bet uh, from $2 to $4. They increased jackpots and progressive jackpots of $10,000. So these video gambling companies and the establishments are already gonna be making more money. They don't need extra machines. I spoke with uh, Professor John Kent, who is an expert on gambling. And he said, on average, the net profit for one video gambling machine per year is $100,000. So that's what you're going to be giving them. Axel Entertainment, which is the largest video gambling operator in the state, recently bought Gold uh, Rush Entertainment, another video gambling company, for $100,000, $100 million cash. So these people are... Uh, flush with cash over people losing their money. They also own 10,000 video gambling machines, almost a third of the machines in the entire state. So increasing the application and operator fees is fine, but uh, please do not give them any more, on any more machines. Springfield has more than enough places where people can go and gamble, and um, it only affects uh, people who are addicted, uh, women and will entice poor people and vulnerable people and it's going to be harmful for the city. Over 600 machines is, is more than enough. So it, I ask that you take the, uh, the um, 
the example of Bloomington where they increased fees, but they held the line on video gambling. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Anybody else wish to address the council on this matter? This is for the amendment yeah, the, first, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's been withdrawn? No, the, the amendment to the amendment has been oh, okay. withdrawn. The amendment is, is still in play. Okay. Do you want to go over that amendment? That's the purpose of this amendment? Is it for the follow-up audits? Is that the one? Should I read it in the record? or? Um, if, if there are questions, the, the effect of the amendment is to provide for a, uh, the initial audit uh, in the event that there is a finding of violation in the initial audit, then it would provide for a $5,000 fine. Then if that occurs, then as there is a mandatory secondary audit that shall occur within 12 months. If the secondary audit indicates a noncompliance with the requirements of, the, of this section, then the license can be subject to non-renewal and or revocation. That's correct. So okay. effectively, it's implementing a, a specific schedule relative to the auditing with fines. That's correct. Any questions on the amendment or discussion? Well, discussion. Yes, I Solomon McMenamin. preferred Alvin Turner's approach where um, two strikes and you're out at least. You know, if, if you... If you fail the second audit, it's mandatory that you lose your license that's and your renewal. Um, that's what it is. No, this, the way this is worded, it's discretionary. Well, it's always going to be subject to the uh, Liquor Commission, you know, somebody trying to challenge it. But this language is virtually identical to what's in the rest of the Liquor Code. In other words, it's telling them what they're subject to. Uh, uh, it, it's not uh, intended to say there wouldn't be action taken. It, what's going to end up happening is if where a person uh, uh, is found to be in non-compliant, we're going to end up with uh, action before the Liquor Commission, possibly in court, just trying to contest simply because of the effectively you're closing their business. Alderman Donnell? So what I hear you saying is it preserves the due process, right, of those who are we, being challenged? We have to provide due process because what's going to end up happening, that this will go through the Liquor Commission with a liquor complaint for violation with a request for a revocation or a denial of renewal, which means it's going to either go right to court or to the Liquor Commission because the effect of this will be to put a, a, a business, uh, uh, in effect, out of business. Thank you. Because well, they cannot operate without the license, well, if that's of any assistance. Again, due process is notice and opportunity to be heard. So, yeah, if we... After a second audit, th they fail a second audit, you get notice and opportunity to contest the audit. But if the audit holds up, I like the word shall. Uh, shall be um, non-renewed and, and revocated. So just to, to the way it's worded, it says the license or cert certificate may be subject to non-renewal revocation. I think we need tougher language. In fact, I would have gotten, you know, after you fail the first audit, you lose your license and your renewal. Because that was the intent uh, five years ago when we, we put this into our code. We really wanted a strict uh, uh, test, and we wanted to yank the, the license for those that don't qualify it for it. So. Is there... Um, if you... Alderman Turner, if you would... Go is, ahead. There, is, there a, is there a problem with the word... Shall? No, I, I was simply going to say if you would like to insert, the effect is going to be the same because what will end up happening is I, I the ought to do it. Okay, I'm saying Ralph, that that make, does I'll not make present a, a do difficulty yeah, if you I'm would good, like to. Good with it? Okay, so can we use the word shall? I, I would rather the word shall yeah, as well. Second. It's so still going to go before the liquor commissioner anyway, I, I assume. And so it's been uh, moved and seconded to accept the word shall. Any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Any discussion on the amendment as on amended the, by the word? Please. Oh, on the uh, actual, we're still talking about the amendment or right, we're talking about the amendment? Oh, I got something on the other one, just a quick question. Okay. Any other, all in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 All the women, Turner. Can we have a, um, a notation, not, not in the ordinance, but can we have a notation? liquor commissioner that we get a report on Violation. audit an yeah. annual report on the audit findings mm -hmm. thank you 
Yes, yeah, probably could. Yeah. Alderman Repat. And, and, you know, I follow uh, Alderman McMinimum's lead on this because, to be honest with you, the people who are following the rules are not the problem. It's the right. people who are not following the rules. You know, they're, they're not in compliance. We don't have enforcement authority. And what this ordinance does is basically allows us to audit them to find out if they're really following the rules or not. And we didn't have that before. We were, it was shooting in the dark. And uh, we, we always assumed that the state was following up with the, with the compliance rules, but, but they weren't. This is going to make sure <coughs> that the people that are, that are operating in the city of Springfield are following the rules. The people that are following the rules, they haven't got a problem with this. People that aren't, they got a problem. Well, and oh, Mayor, yeah. one, one thing to keep in mind, I think in, in the last, the, the list that I saw from uh, from Mr. McCarty was there's only 30, 30 um, businesses in the, that are not grandfathered in right now. Right. 30. I was shocked by that. I thought I thought it would be quite a bit more, but um, so there's not a lot to audit. Any other discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. So, Mayor. any discussion on the ordinance as amended? Yeah, Mayor, I, I just have one question on, um, on, on the original ordinance. I, I, I thought last week we did a technical, um, technical um, amendment on number K, the last, the very last. Where we, we I actually, yeah, it was a, it was a technical amendment to, to to go back to the original, um, to the original correct. language. Uh, it's currently not in this form, but I just want assurances that that, that was done. Yeah, all of the amendments will be okay. integrated into the okay. final. Uh, but it wasn't in the final. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's fine. Thank I think you. this is, the, I believe this is the fourth amendment, and those will all be put into the final uh, ordinance at uh, uh, language that is attached to the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on the ordinance as amended? All those in favor of the ordinance as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes eight voting yes, one voting no, one voting present. And that concludes the city council agenda items. With regards to unfinished business, I'd like to uh, read a statement with regards to Helping Hands zoning request for the Center for Health and Housing. Ever since the July 24th public announcement of Helping Hands Center for Health and Housing, everyone has been in agreement that the concept makes sense. As expected, points of disagreement among other items include the location and capacity. After a lengthy and divisive four-hour discussion and after the failure of a prove a request for a 30-day extension to allow the parties to talk, the zoning request was approved by an 8-2 to two vote. Before the vote was taken, I emphasized, whatever the result of the vote, we all need to work together to prove the success for the Center of Health and Housing. Since the center would not open until December 1st, the city's Department of Community Relations has been preparing to open the winter warming center on November 1st and operate it until it is no longer needed. Like prior years, when the state of Illinois cut service funding, the city of Springfield, along with Helping Hands and the Continuum of Care, ensured that a low barrier space was available for our homeless needs. This year is no different and it is all of our responsibility to assure the same level of services provided this year. Unfortunately, what has failed to take place prior to and after the zoning vote is a meeting with all funding and impacted stakeholder organizations. With the community divided and unaddressed concerns, both Memorial Health Services and HSHS St. John's heard the voices of all concerned and rightfully asked for community agreement and resolution of concerns prior to their participation. By listening and understanding and working with people of differing opinions, we can have a better solution. Case in point was with the relocation of Salvation Army, which also boarded the rail corridor that will eventually carry 60 trains a day. Through listening and working with impacted stakeholders, the Salvation Army came up with a better solution for which I confidently cast the tie-breaking vote of approval. The Helping Hands Center for Health and Housing project is no different. 
Having an open and honest discussion with all the funding and impacted stakeholder organizations will yield better solutions for all concerned. I believe in the concept as first presented by Erica Smith that the Center for Health and Housing is like a emergency room triage situation. The homeless individuals come in, you assess their situation, and then you rely on the providers to provide that support that they need on a regular, ongoing basis for their in-depth needs. What started out as a project to address homeless needs has now grown to address other needs because of the size of the building. According to yesterday's State Journal Register, the building might include a community crisis center for nonviolent individuals needing a safe place to go during mental health and drug withdrawal emergencies. According to the article, this would be an alternative instead of being housed in the county jail, which is already over capacity. In my opinion and view, the Center for Health and Housing, this was never the original intent of the project but one that has grown because of the size of the building. I do not believe homeless families and individuals that have different needs should be housed in the same facility. However, we have now have the opportunity to determine the right project scope, boundaries and solutions with the additional partnering entities of Sangamon County, Capital Township, and federal government financial resources. Because of their interest and support for the project, I will also invite Sangamon County Chairman Andy Van Meter, Sangamon County Treasurer and Capital Township Administrator Joe Elio, and Senator Durbin's office to the stakeholders' meetings. Since serving as mayor in 2015, I have held true to my commitment on projects of this magnitude. My leadership style is unique from other mayors. I will allow my directors to give their opinion so the aldermen have a true understanding of their viewpoint. They provide the information and I do not lobby the city council members for support one way or the other. Instead, I prefer that city council members make a conscientious decision, an informed decision based on information. For that reason, and because the measure passed with a veto-proof supermajority, I will not veto the ordinance. However, I will not sign the ordinance, so it will take, not take effect for 30 days after passage. As I stated before, I ask that helping hands and the funding organizations come to the table with all stakeholders. This way we can work together in finding the best solution for the Center for Health and Housing and our, for our entire community for the benefit of all concerned. Thank you. Point of order? Yes, Alderman Redpath. Corporation Council, if it's not vetoed, it's a committee and it cannot be vetoed. Is that correct? I'm sorry? If, the, if this is not vetoed at this meeting, it cannot be vetoed. Is that correct? Uh, the mayor indicated that he is not going to veto the ordinance, and the effect of that, uh, it, it, just very briefly, it's a unique situation because of a zoning docket. So the ordinance becomes effective at the next meeting at which zoning, because it, it goes from meeting to meeting, uh, that zoning could be uh, addressed. So the effective date of the ordinance, in my view, based on our best research, would be effective, uh, I guess it would be two weeks from today. And I, I, I compliment the mayor for his opinion and, and, and that part. I just don't want to come back and say, we change our mind, we're going to veto it, okay? If, it, if <laughs> you that's going to happen, no, let's get it piece. on now. So. That's right. Okay. So really, it really comes down to everybody coming to the table and figuring this thing out. Because in the current condition, I think, uh, you know, there's been, um, you know, it showed the divisiveness within our community. We saw it play out. Um, it is frustrating for all of us, but it's up to all of us. We have a great community. This is our, I told Alderman Turner, I said, this really is our moment to shine. I think uh, Alderman Hanauer mentioned this could be the model. It could be if we do it right. But the way it's, it's uh, in its current condition, um, we're not there. And that's where it's important for everybody to come together and really determine how are we going to address the needs, you know, with the overcapacity, now the overcapacity at the county, uh, the uh, detox, the mental health. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're talking about video gaming. Uh, the cannabis is coming online. I mean, we have some, we have to look futuristically at what type of community we want for everybody. And we need to address those. And the only one way we can do that is by working together. So we intend to do that. Excuse me, Mayor. I'm sorry. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a point of clarification for uh, Corporation Council. Is my understanding that uh, 
for all the years being in this room that any ordinance that's not acted upon by the, by the mayor automatically becomes effective the next council meeting if it's not acted upon and meaning not signed. And the, the code and the, and I looked, and the code and the consent decree neither differentiate, differentiate can even say it, uh, regular, I'll say regular ordinances and uh, zoning ordinances. It doesn't specify that, that there is a difference. They're all treated the same per the consent decree and the code. No, I'll be happy to reduce my opinion to writing. Um, there is no case or case law directly on point on this issue. Uh, there's a preliminary question of whether or not um, zoning dockets are even subject to veto. Um, the, there are no cases on it. However, Mayor Hacera had vetoed an ordinance, a zoning ordinance. Uh, that's the only one that I'm aware of in the history of the city, at least uh, in recent past. So I would be happy to um, uh, provide you something in writing on that. I, I would appreciate that. And sure. I guess the only in, in experience, is at least a sitting, sitting at the table as an alderman, that I, I can relate to is uh, when we first came into office, uh, Mayor Houston had uh, vetoed an ordinance. And when we came in, we uh, overrode the veto. Mm -hmm. and uh, But we were told at that time that if we, if, if it wasn't signed and, and nothing was done, it would automatically go into effect. So uh, based on upon that experience, so I would appreciate that research. The, the difference is that that was not a zoning ordinance. No, and I understand zoning that, but the code... By our, zoning ordinances by our code, by city ordinance, are only addressed once a month. I understand that, but so the we could not sections... legally We could not legally take a work to, to pass a zoning ordinance tonight. Right. So the, the difficulty is when it refers to, it gets very technical, when it refers to the next meeting, typically that has been interpreted the next meeting at which action could be could be taken. Right, right. Jim. So in I, I turn, just, I'll be happy to reduce it to I'm just I'm just trying to understand it and make it clear, but yep. the only sections of the code and the consent decree that mention anything about vetoes, it says at the next meeting. That's, that's why I, had, I thought, that's why I asked for this clarification. <laughs> Certainly. Alderwoman Conley. And kind of to, to piggyback on that, um, and I, I don't, I'm not familiar with this process, but what date starts the 30-day clock ticking if... From the date of original passage. So that would be from that two weeks ago. Okay. So we're already two weeks into the 30-day clock. That is correct. Okay, so what date is that 30 days? October 15th? It would be the next zoning uh, meeting. Okay. Which I would, I, let's see, today's the first, so we have 14 days. Okay. The, the Thank 15. you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the ultimate make minimum. Well, I think our city attorney has been consistent with a ruling of a couple of months ago when we were deciding whether we could revote a zoning matter, and we decided that the next meeting for zoning would be at the next zoning council meeting, not the next city council meeting. So I think uh, our city attorney's been consistent with that line of reasoning. Uh, but I think it's inconsequential, really, whether the ordinance, the zoning ordinance becomes effective um, this week or two weeks from now, because really, I think, um, and our mayor's been taking a lot of hits on this, but I think the mayor is trying to be realistic with what we're facing here. We're facing the threat of litigation, and that's what is the problem. We can agree to any zoning matter we want, but if there's parties out there that want to litigate the zoning decision, um, then that puts helping hands in a real quandary because they, do they go ahead and buy a building for, I don't know what the price was, Couple, a few hundred thousand dollars, rehabilitate the building for another couple hundred thousand dollars, and then face a uh, temporary restraining order because they can't move in because a judge has said that there's possibilities of a zoning mistake. We saw a very expert zoning attorney here uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he came in from out of town. I mean, he, he looked serious to me. Uh, I think he really was preparing for litigation. That was my thought. So I think the mayor's being realistic, and I hope Helping Hands is being realistic here. And the hospitals, that why put up massive amounts of resources, whether we like the location or not? I personally thought it was you know, a, an acceptable location because it's wedged between railroad tracks and a four-lane road. It's not <laughs> inside of a residence. It's on the very perimeter of a residential neighborhood. But that, besides the point, if you're faced with litigation, you got to be careful how you proceed. And so, um, you know, Helping Hands is in a quandary. 
Do they, cl they close on the real estate uh, transaction with that threat hanging over their heads? So that's my point of view, Mr. Mayor. Alderman Gregory. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. You know, um, I, uh, one of the reporters asked me last week, he said, uh, when are you going to take control? So t tonight is the night that I'm going to take control on this situation. So McMinniman, Alderman McMinniman, excuse me, sir, just brought up the fact of litigation. Um, and I don't think by not signing it or signing it that we're going to avoid it. Um, I would love to extend it 30 days and work it out. But I don't know if, if, if I can budge either one of those uh, uh, people that, that are, are really upset about this or any other way. And, and honestly, I don't want to take it out 30 more days. I don't want to deal with it for 30 more days. And at some point in time, we got to make a big boy decision and we either going to do it and we're going to let uh, Mr. Zirko handle handle what, what he needs to handle on, on uh, uh, legal factors, or we're not going to do it, and we're going to look for another location if Helping Hands and Memorial and St. John's want to do it. And that's, and that's just that simple. Um, we've been in these meetings. I've talked to our community. I've been open. I really, really looked at every situation we can to really make this happen and sold it to our community. And then they kicked it back to me, and, and, and an 80-year-old woman, she called me. She said, slow down. She said, she said, Sean, this is not about the present of why people are so angry. She said, Sean, it is about us taking a break. She said, last time, it was over by a sign company. The people from Sangamon Tower said they didn't want it and they moved it over here. We swallowed it. St. John, our Salvation Army, the last time we made some changes, the community swallowed it. And, and as much as I want to make something happen, twist it, turn it to, 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 to do it, and I don't have no choice but to respect, to, to, to really respect their thoughts. And, and I don't agree with how this thing went down. I told people from my community that to their face at my town hall that I didn't like all of that. I'm not a fan of that. That's why you, nobody in here has heard much from me. Because when we're talking about human life, I don't want to do all of that. I just want to get to a situation. I'm not interested in that, but I'm not bashing anybody who does. Do what you do to get my attention or your elected officials' attention. I encourage you to hold us all accountable and talk with us. But, um, you know, so my, my decision, regardless, you know, would, would still be a no. Because I, 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 just, I just don't see him turning the mayor. Like I said, we need to work together to make it a success. And that's incumbent upon all of us. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Is there any uh, other unfinished business coming before the council? Any um, uh, Alderman McMenamin? Yeah, I, I'm going back to what we started with earlier. Uh, the liquor, uh, the change to our liquor code regarding allowing hotels and motels to sell liquor. I just looked at the fine print. What we've agreed to do is allow any registered guest to go to the front desk at a hotel or motel and get 12 bottles of beer or cans and three bottles of wine. Now, if you are in the next door room to the guy that just got 12, 12 ounce containers of beer and three bottles of wine, would you feel comfortable necessarily in that hotel, motel room right next door? I've traveled all around the world, uh, let's say Illinois and, and USA. I can't remember where I've seen uh, a 12 bottle rule. Now, maybe we got one, but that's why we should pass things through the committee the whole so we can get lots of points of view here. Um, we don't want our, neighbor, our city to be known as, you know, they can party in their rooms at any hotel or motel. You can just party away, see how, what kind of reputation we get. And, um, and furthermore, maybe our, our um, actual liquor stores, maybe they'd have a problem with this, um, this ordinance. Uh, maybe our, the, um, the um, um, tavern nearby the hotel has a problem with this. Maybe they, they're gonna lose customers over this. So I think we should have all allowed everyone that had an interest in this, discuss it and not just spring this out of committee um, without notice to anybody about three months after we first see 
what this might be about without any particulars. <coughs> Three months ago when this got to us, it didn't say anything about 12 bottles of beer. It just said there was some permission that would be allowed to hotel and motels. So I just asked the other alderman, you know, let's think things through before we act. And if there's an opportunity to wait, there's no rush to this. There's no need to just rush things through just because one alderman, you know, what happens here is I better scratch his or her back because next week I might need a scratch or so forth. And that happens way too often on this council. And I'm just letting my thoughts uh, way out there and the mass media can take and run with this if you want. But this is something serious and this is not the way to do legislation, period. Excuse me. Alderwoman Turner. Um, just for the record, I have I have been in a legislative position for a vast number of years successfully, and in all of those years, I have never uh, done anything in a rash moment. I've always taken time to research, talk to uh, my colleagues, talk to interested parties, and then come to a decision that I then take back to my colleagues so that I can get um, consensus. That's the way I operate. That's the way I operated on this situation as well. And I will tell you that when you said that you've traveled all over and you've never seen an ordinance that has uh, 12 bottles of beer and, and three uh, bottles of wine, the reason why you haven't seen that is because in every other ordinance that I researched, there was no limit anywhere. So actually, Springfield was being very proactive and ahead of the curve. And once again, we were being a role model for other municipalities to follow because we did insert a quantity. And uh, I will also say that every other ordinance that I researched did not require that the individuals who were uh, working the pantries to be trained. Again, Springfield is being a leader and a role model because our ordinance requires those individuals to be trained. So I think that before we throw out these allegations and encourage the media to take it and run with it, we should all know and understand uh, and, and have factual information that we're sharing and that we're asking the media to take and run with it. Again, Mr. Mayor, on this here, we don't have any opportunity to get factual information because was my main point is it's a bad idea to spring something out of nowhere on the night of passage. We should go through a deliberative process. That, and I politely ask, can we just consider this next week at Committee of the Whole? Let everyone who wants to think about this and talk about it have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. We got to do it right now tonight. And that's what I object to. But then you threw out all this false information to try to make me look bad, and that's it's unacceptable. We all look bad when this happens. That, I think I look pretty good in this one. Any other discussion on that topic? Any other uh, unfinished business? Any uh, Alderman Redpath? Uh, Corporation Council, I uh, made a request for a ordinance for um, the cannabis sales and asked that that ordinance be put together. Uh, my request was to put a $10,000 application fee on, and that money would be do, uh, designated to go to homeless veterans. And then in addition to that, a five-year, uh, I mean, a, the, uh, an annual fee of $5,000 a year on the, those uh, those places dispensing it. Uh, I was under, I'm under the understanding today that there was other things that added to that ordinance, and it, it, I'd like for those things to be removed. The, and yeah, the, uh, the issue, yeah, we, uh, the, the ordinance that's on is the one that I'd given you originally a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the problem with the, just uh, very technical here, but the city cannot put a fee on a dispensary. Indirectly, the city can put a fee for on-site consumption because it's up to the city to decide if we even allow it. And on-site consumption can only be with a dispensary. So indirectly, the only way to uh, be able to have a fee on a dispensary is through that if, if the council decides to do the on-site. The 10,000 and the, um, 
5,000, I believe, are in there, and I think there's a reference to this, the compliance with the, their, uh, I think, the social justice. I'll have to look at it, but we can go over it very yeah, quickly. Yeah, we need, to, we need to, to change that because I'm not, I don't support that. I don't support the parlors or anything like that to be initiated. Yeah, this does not address parlors at all. Okay. No. Because the city does not allow, just, just real quickly, because I think there is some, apparently some confusion. You may remember that the zoning ordinance that came through the council that was discussed at some length referenced uh, on-site consumption. I think it was talked about uh, quite a bit. Under the proposed zoning changes that have gone to the zoning board that will come back to the council in November uh, have two things. One is the on-site can only be associated with a dispensary, only with a dispensary, of which the city currently has one. So that doesn't and deal with parlors? The, the, you cannot have a parlor in Springfield, nor do I think you can do that under state law, though it is my understanding there's quite a controversy going on in Chicago on that very issue. And under the, keep in mind that the city, uh, the only area that the city has direct impact on is on on-site consumption. That was left up to, under the state law, uh, for municipalities to decide. The city has the option of saying none. It has the option of saying only with dispensers. Dispensaries was what the state law, I think, intended, okay. and there's some ambiguity that's being argued about in uh, the uh, Chicago. And um, the uh, so the city, uh, if you will, the draft is associated only with the dispensary. There's no such thing as a parlor under the either the state law under the or under the cities, and as a practical matter, there's an additional requirement for a CPU, which means that the dispensary doesn't even get it automatically. They actually have to come back and ask for it. So the only way, because of the way the state law is constructed, the city cannot impose additional licensing fees on the dispensary but I believe we can successfully do it on an on-site uh, consumption premise associated with the dispensary. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, and I apologize if it caused some confusion because it is very technical well, and we there's heard about a lot of... on WMAY this morning. <laughs> no, and I... <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I pulled back into town from New Orleans and all I heard was, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> well, it needs to be clear because the, the what the council, rec uh, I shouldn't say recommended, sent for zoning the only place there can be on-site consumption is at a dispensary. Okay. Right. Only. Thank you. And that's still, I'm sorry. Alderman Hanner. And, and that's, that's still yet to, we, as a body, we have to decide that. That is correct. Right. And it's not, we don't have anything in the near future. That, that is correct. What will end up, just briefly, what's going to end up happening is, you may recall that there's a, uh, the council had passed a resolution sending it, which we have to do under statute, to the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission. It comes back as a recommendation, but it's subject to amendment. So you'll end up voting on the final version uh, in November. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Alderman to, to inform the public, what we're talking about here is an ordinance to it, which um, <coughs> Alderman Redpath, Turner, and Hanauer introduced. It's on first reading, which means we'll discuss it next week. It will, in effect, allow and I'm just reading it now, it will allow uh, at our downtown uh, medicinal um, dispensary to allow people to get high in, inside the dispensary. That's, 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 that's the effect order, of the ordinance. I got the floor right now. So point of order, Mayor. That's, that is order. not, that is not, that, that was I've got the floor right now. And that so was if you, a mistake. If, if, if and I'm, your, and, and so I'm reading, just reading from the ordinance. Read something that's a mistake. You're reading them. We'll be discussing That's it what next we week. That's what we just talked about, that it was an error. He's trying to, it's he's an trying to bad mouth Wait till next week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Bad mouth no, I it's think uh, the clarification was made that yeah. this Go would ahead. be for sites other than the dispensary. No. I think in I think we should just not Council's hear what we just said. We just said we're taking out all that. That's not supposed to be well, in let me. Council. Okay, I'll change a little bit here and just let's just talk about the fact that... Excuse me. I'm just talking about... We're having a general conversation about um, but cannabis. But Alderman McMenamin, you just said that we should, you just said that. So you've clarified that, that the, what was introduced has changed already. So, oh, okay, I'll wait for the change there. version. Thank Appreciate you. that. That's easy. But, um, I would just encourage everyone that cares about this issue, the zoning meeting will be um, 
second meeting in November. For, I'm sorry, for you, you mean the planning commission? Yeah, planning well, commission. Next week, I'm sorry. Yeah. The zoning on cannabis will be, uh, we'll have a meeting uh, on, on the ordinance we passed two weeks ago. Um, He's on, in, in, in October, two weeks. Said, yes, and then is potentially, correct. depending on what other Red Pass ordinance is going to do, we might have another meeting in, in November uh, of the zoning. Not if I can help it, Joe. Okay. But at any rate, <laughs> just to inform the public, um, Decatur voted, I think it was six to two against. Uh, um, we'll take that money. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. Uh, anywhere in the city limits, and the city of Chicago uh, has voted, or is, looks like they're going to um, preclude dispensaries in their downtown because they're really concerned about the impact on their tourism and their reputation for downtown. So, I just want to say that I hope, and Nina, you're still here, when you go to the zoning commission ask that we not have a recreational dispensary in our historic district. We really don't want folks coming into our historic district and getting high and, and walking around. And we don't want those that are homeless to be tempted to go in and, and, and purchase what little cash they have to get high downtown, wander around and, and create a problem. So I think if we're going to have dispensaries, let's not have them in our historic district downtown. So that's... Not everyone get who uses marijuana all gets all high. Well, you're in turn. All in an hour. Your turn. Thank you. All you got to have your turn? Just wait. All in an hour. All in an hour. All in an hour. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. And all right. First, first of all, the, what was requested was to put, to, to, just to clarify some things, folks. Let, let's let's get this clarification done. What we what we asked for yeah, was a ten thousand. No side conversations, please. Tell him that he started it. We, you you asked. <laughs> we asked for a ten thousand uh, dollar uh, fee application fee on a dispensary only. There was nothing that we put in there when at least when we pushed it forward that said anything about on-site consumption not anything whatsoever that's number one and then every year it's a five thousand per per dispensary charge that's what we put together now to say that we threw this in there that we were going to add add a, a local on-site consumption is just wrong it was, it, I don't know what happened between the time that we put it in and the time it came out, but it was put in wrong. Now, secondly, the, the final thing I'll say is, I've never seen anyone that takes a loss harder than you, Alderman. You don't <laughs> let things go. You oh, lost, the, you lost, you, you've lost multiple votes and you that's keep the way it bringing goes, them Ralph. back up. You're still gonna lose. That's, it that's why I got reelected, Ralph. That's why our television ratings on Channel 18 are going up. <laughs> Sky high, pun intended. Oh my goodness. In any event, we will we will research it. It's my understanding. It's my understanding the uh, fine amount or the amount that we're charging, whatever you want to call it, the fee, is related to the ability to provide the on-site. And that's what we and and so we may just have to, it I may be a just dead ordinance. Interpretation. <laughs> it, it may very well be a right. dead ordinance. It depends on what the what the council decides if they want on-site consumption. It, it, it is a policy issue, absolutely, right. yes. Alderman Gregory. I just want to encourage us, one, we throw around, the city throws around too many stigmas. Everybody who smokes weed, not a bad person, excuse me, cannabis. Everybody who is homeless is not a bad person. Um, so I'm over it. I'm over all the stigmas. Thank you. Thank Jesus. You. Um, Thank you. Secondly, we got to stop being, you know, I just, I just, uh, the Citizens Club, they just had a great meeting. They said this city is slow to change and like, doesn't like change. It's a legal law. I don't, I'm not saying we rush into everything, but we need to, we need to be ready for it because it's coming. There's all types of little funny little events that you may not be used to that people are going to want to do and they're going to be banging down our doors. I, I talked to, uh, um, Alder McDonald a little bit earlier, just, just, just really casting some some things over 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 his eyes. It didn't change his opinion much, but but <laughs> it didn't change his opinion much. But I'm working on him, so give me a chance. 
but 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 what it did do and what we did connect is he he, he understood uh, a few more things I do believe uh, about it. It's it's, it, um, it's not all about you know getting a, a lounge and uh, just having a, uh, a smoke fest or anything like that. People cook with with uh, cannabis infused butters and all types of things. I mean, eventually I, I know we got to first get illegal. We may not even go there with Joe and these ordinances, Mr. McMenamin, excuse me, uh, with his ordinances. But if we do, I just want us to be all clear and open mind that we may have to take a look at some things down the line that are a little, a little bit outside our comfort zone, and it's, it's okay. If I could just also clarification, sure. um, because I feel like... All of them Conley. Um, Alderman Hanauer, Redpath, and, and Turner, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, mostly myself, but the original ordinance um, that was proposed that I brought forward, or amend, that we amended, does allow for on-site consumption as, as a conditional permitted use. So if you're going to be throwing things at anybody, that would probably be me. Sorry. Um, I do think it's an important conversation for us to well, have. It comes to help the veterans. <laughs> I it's it's I, I just I just want to say I I I, I um, and and also um, Alderman Gregory again um, brought up an important issue that just happened in our city, which was the millennials talking about things that they want to see in 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 our community. Um, since I have children in that generation, I'm I'm officially old, I guess, or older, and and I think it's important that we make sure that as we plan for the city, we're planning for our future, and we're planning for future generations in a way that's safe and protective, but also encouraging and and draws them in. And Alderman Gregory, I mentioned this to you already. I, I appreciate your perspective on that, and um, I'm looking forward to a healthy and hopefully respectful conversation around um, the final passage of this ordinance. Thank you. Any other unfinished business? New business? I, I have one new business. I'm, I'm sorry, Gregory. guys. I, I apologize. So, um, Officer Newman, he stepped out. So I have I have this issue um, on. I, I wanted him to touch base on. It. I, I'm gonna try to hurry, but we have I have this issue over on uh, 17th Street. We've been emailing about it. Um, I spoke to Mr. Harris a little bit about it, um, and we're we're working on some things to do. But what I do want to look into, Mr. Uh, Zirkel, um, if you can help me, I want to look into what can be done in particularly War Two. Um, to, to look at restricting uh, single-serve al alcoholic beverages, 40 ounces and below. And, and, and if you can help me with that, I don't know if I can do it, if I can't, but I do want to look at it. I haven't made a decision, but I definitely do. M Mr. Harris, if, if I can speak to you uh, about, can I ask you a question about that situation? Sure. Shoot. <clears throat> So thank you. You, <laughs> you sent me. Um, we we we've been corresponding on on that situation, correct? On that uh, on 17th and Stewart, I believe. 1718. 1718 Stewart. Yes. Um, and I know that you had emailed me. So part of the reason why I'm looking into this is because that situation there is just totally out of control. Again, an older lady. You know, I went over and I talked to her. She said, "Baby, before I go on home, all I want to do is live a few years." in peace. So I'm trying to really work on the area. So that's why I've been sending a lot of emails and I've really been on it. I've talked to Mr. Mr. Newman about it. I've also talked to the chief about it because I really, really, really want something done. Um, per our email, you, you replied back to me, and this is something that I'm going to speak to the mayor about, but you said we spent $3,000 to clean it up. Cool. And I'm good with that, but we got to keep it going because I just went by the other day and it's filthy. And if we have had somebody cut grass, then we need to get a refund because those are the fastest growing plants that I've ever seen in my life. Okay. And I'm just being honest. Okay, well, Mayor, <laughs> Mayor. Yes, sir. If it is about money, then we, I want to sit down with whoever makes these decisions so we can get budget. a little more money and we can get these properties done. And mm -hmm. last but not least, if I could, and I know it's going to be a lot of work, and I'm not trying to be this type, but if I can get a report like every six months on the east side properties that we own, the city, and what we're doing to fix them and cut them, please. I believe you. I gave you a report uh, before a few months ago. Mm -hmm. It wasn't six months have not passed so far that I know of because I've been in this position for six months. Yes, sir. So I know that can't be altogether um, 
Right. In concert. But I can tell you this. Yes, sir. The property that you're talking about has been cut multiple times. Okay. And the $3,000 bill was actually $3,177. Yes, sir. It was actually to remove trees and samplings for that whole backyard. If you are more interested in that particular project, we also have photos that suggest it wasn't just a mere taking I, a... I, let me finish, please. I got some, too. It wasn't just a mere taking a... Um, cutter or grass cutter and going up and down, it was actually cutting down vegetation okay. that was more than 20 to 30 feet high. Okay. And it also meant scraping the soil content right. on the top to ensure that we didn't have no further growth in the backyard. I think what you're referring to is mainly the front yard. So that $3,100 expense incorporated the front and the back and very large uh, vegetation that was gone because of the person who actually owned that property is now deceased. And when you're going through the legal system with a deceased person, the property owner, it's kind of somewhat alone. But we, I can assure you that the property has been cut more than once. And the property that you're talking about, your predecessor, uh, older woman, uh, previous older woman that was in that particular position, mm -hmm. had just met in that July mm -hmm. to ensure that the cleanup efforts were done properly. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of we're not doing our due diligence to clean the property. It's just it's kind of difficult to clean the properties, and you're watching individuals standing right there at the property at the time that you're abating the situation mm -hmm. with bags of liquor and other type Amen. items there immediately after you leave or while you're there. Yes. Dumping it right back on that right. property. Right. So right. Your, the, the cleanup effort is going to be a lot more uh, uh, longer. And... Also, the expense and stuff of going to that property mm -hmm. probably six or eight times every week. I think what you were suggesting, I was saying, that would have a cost impact. Right. And we ought to, like, to serve the entire city. Right. Spring well, down. not every week, but maybe we need to look at that place monthly. Whatever we can do. Mm -hmm. And I understand we got, we, I understand I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that particular area is a complete, it is absolutely the worst area probably in this city. Absolutely, the probably. I said probably because there's a lot of them, so and I know them, so yeah. I said probably. I will put it up there. It is terrible. So I agree with you. Hold on. I agree with you. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. It's not totally, wait, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I agree with you that it's not totally on any of our workers. I'm not saying that. That's why I'm looking in from a policy standpoint, doing my job to see what we can do to reduce the things that are thrown there that's making your job a little harder. Um, and I'm also going to talk to Chief after you about these folks getting tickets and, and are staying on it and until they get tired of sitting out there because we have to do something. That's part of the reason this... And this is going to my council members. This is part of the reason why I can't find a way to say yes to the homeless shelter. Because I got people in my streets in the daytime, smoking, drinking, doing whatever they want. And when I talk to my, our officers about what can we do about it, there's not much that can be done about it. Or they don't necessarily want to go sit at the hospital for two hours. I get it. I wouldn't want to do it neither. But to clean the situation up in our in our community in War Two, I can't speak for everybody else. But to clean this situation up that I've been elected about, we gotta we we gonna see at least six months or a year of some hard real work. And we gotta ticket them every time until they get sick of sitting there all day long with liquor, smoking, and whatever else. Then we, that's what we need to do. And if we need more officers, I'm gonna work with the good okay. mayor. That's and we need to hire some more. Well, we have a report to you to show you how many cleanup efforts has been expended at a particular I definitely site. definitely want that. You have a first thing in the morning. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Darrell. Chief. You do a great job. Chief. You're next. And the only reason I'm even talking is because I get calls about these things all day long since I've been elected. It's about this one little spot. So... That, that particular spot, Chief, I know we talked, and you guys have been doing a great job. I'm not ragging on nobody that they're not. I'm just saying that we got to figure it out. Like, if we got to take them every time, I would like it. I don't know if you can. I'm just saying what I would like. If we got to take them every time we catch them with some liquor on the public city way, because I just had a situation on 13th when I got here, and we got on there about that, right? It settled down, so this situation's... A, if they're on a public way, we can cite them. The issue sometimes is that they're on private property. Sometimes they're on a city way. Yes. I know they've issued them obstructing sidewalk tickets for putting their chairs out there, for the drinking out there. Right. I'll follow with uh, 
uh, admin and see where we're at as far as an mm -hmm. admin court when their court dates are and make sure it doesn't get dropped okay. out. But with that, the thing we're trying to do is that house has now defaulted to the county. Right. And there's a title issue that I was just talking to the police legal advisor today, John Zimmerman, about as far as in trying to get a trespass agreement so we can enforce this stuff on private property. Because if I'm one foot on the other side of the road mm -hmm. or on the other side of the sidewalk, mm -hmm. my guys can't do nothing about it if okay. he's on private property. Okay. So as soon as we get the trespass agreement, if we can get the county on board with that, that will give us some authority to enforce that, <coughs> and hopefully that will move everybody along. All right. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Good job, Chief. Any other uh, new business? October uh, does mark the Real Men Wear Pink campaign for the Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you, Alderman Hanauer, for wearing a pink shirt. So, we do have some individuals signed up to uh, address the council. First was Donald Martin. Is Donald here? My name is Donald Martin. <clears throat> 904 Westview Drive. <clears throat> this might pertain to what he was just concerned with about substance abuse and people getting tickets. I'm here to address the council concerning the reconsideration of sales of cannabis in Springfield. We've had issues concerning homeless facilities and substance abuse recently, in which two members of the council, Gregory and Turner, had asked for an extension, reason being more information was needed to help with the decision concerning such a pro proposal on location. In light of just one week, more information surfaces, more substances. Now in the light of two weeks, I happened to volunteer to help clean up downtown Springfield for Route 66 event and found <coughs> the homeless were loitering and littering everywhere. One place in particular was the old state capitol where it smelled so bad a year and I felt nauseous walking past the, um, the stairwell going down to the underground parking. I felt bad for the eatery that was just feet away and I could only imagine what our tourists are thinking of our city when they visit. I say this in hopes that it doesn't get increasingly worse with the sales of cannabis inviting more of this activity plus more people on the public assistance and welfare. Then last week, everyone, everybody except McMenamin is all still in favor of more substances being sold and available in Springfield. We supposedly have a Board of Education members as well as Board of Health members willingly supporting this idea because of monetary gain. Just out of curiosity, why is everybody supporting this amenity? It's, um, does the city not require drug screening? for any of your employees. I've emailed council about this, received no response. I believe I contacted Aaron Conley. There is no drug screening for the city, not any before inauguration, not any for their employees. Isn't it peculiar that if, in fact, that it was considered legal, everybody could participate without risk of suspension or dismissal from their jobs, just the same as tobacco, alcohol, or vaping? City employees are that tested. alone qu brings questions of legality of such substances. How are we able to claim something is legal and then tell them only certain people that they are unable to participate? This is not equality before the law. <clears throat> I know everybody is thinking, well, it's legal from the state's perspective. Legal being the operative word here. I would like you to think about what is legal. Has it already been law that everything medicinal and ingestible has to be accepted and approved by the FDA to even be available? In fact, the cannabis was actually legal, wouldn't it be approved by the FDA? We can't keep ignoring laws that are already written for the mere reason of monetary gain. How can we enforce the laws that are in place for the equality of all when the members of our public office are making decisions that are conflicting with our laws? The federal government has already enforced the removal of certain substances that were not approved by the FDA, according to the media, and we can only presume there were others. And I'm wondering why are they still allowing ca cannabis to be continued to be sold? The FDA has approved CBDs and put Surgeon General warnings on alcohol, tobacco, and vaping, all in which have led to legal matters, hospitalization, and or fatalities. Also health-related issues throughout history, but not affiliated or approved medicinal cannabis or recreational cannabis. 
Doesn't anybody realize that our elected officials are passing laws that common citizens are subject to fines and or imprisonment for, especially if we label them medic medical or medicinal? If it is pertaining to monetary gain, would it be fair to presume that people were to obtain a license and pay taxes, they would be allowed to sell anything illegal on the street? Realizing that this is condescending and somewhat abrasive, I do apologize to everybody. Yet, it is still a legitimate question. I seen Monday, yesterday, as a matter of fact, that our Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, was recalling a brand of dog food. I know this seems irrelevant, but just think they actually approve dog food and cat food and all the medicines that go along with these dogs and cats that everybody's so concerned with because of animal rights. They approve everything that's ingestible, even for our animals. And yet people are treating our animals better than the people who make their food. It seems as though very few people want to uphold what's best for our way of life as long as they can profit from it these days or think about being law-abiding citizens. Therefore, I'm asking and hoping you can see it through to reconsider opting out of the sales of cannabis in Springfield and set precedents for a better law-abiding way of life. I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you. Any other individuals wish to address the council? Is there a motion for adjournment? We have an executive session. Uh, uh, nothing for tonight. Yep. Excuse me? Nothing for tonight. Tim, I contacted you and requested one earlier. Um, earlier this week, we did. Uh, we certainly can. Is it regarding just the potential litigation question? No, nothing has happened since the since all of this has uh, developed. If uh, if the council is wanting to discuss the potential uh, issue relating to litigation, we can certainly do that. Okay. But nothing has happened. We've had I, no further contact. I understand contact. that, but. Understood. There were several aldermen that wanted to just have executive session. Okay, we can certainly do that relating to pending, probable, or yes. imminent litigation. Yes. Second. Move second. We, All in favor say aye. 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 Both. We're adjourned for executive session. Yeah, exa yeah recessed. Recessed. Yes. Our case. <laughs> Monday. Yeah. to uh, reconvene the regular city council so meeting. So moved. Second. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Uh, We're adjourned. Thank you.